Hello again, everyone. Welcome to another edition of Miked Up Sports. As we continue our conversation about George Floyd and the worldwide reaction that has dominated news coverage over the last couple of weeks. And joining me are a couple of podcast veterans. They are the co-hosts of Unwanted Opinions, uh, but we certainly want to hear their opinions today. So why don't you go ahead and introduce yourselves to the masses? Hello, people. I'm Crystal Thomas, um, one half of the Unwanted Opinion podcast. And I am Reagan Patrick, and I am the other half of the Unwanted Opinions podcast. Now, the two of you have already discussed George Floyd. It was about a week after his death and the protests that were starting to take shape. So if you don't mind, I don't want you to give away the entire discussion because you can listen to it on the Unwanted Opinions podcast site through Podbean. But what did you guys talk about and what has changed from the episode you recorded about a week ago? Um, we, I, I guess we kind of just talked about how we felt, how we still feel, and basically, um, how a lot of people are feeling right now, uh, because of what happened and, and kind of, I guess kind of how it's not something new. It's something that we felt for a while, but I guess it's being amplified because of the events that did occur. Um, like what, like a week or two weeks ago now, something like that, but like, it's, we kind of just basically spoke our feelings about it. Yeah. Um, the episode is just, it's a raw conversation that me and Casey had about the events that were going on. Um, it was actually the first time that we talked about it together. So you do, or, well, you are able to feel um, what we felt. And it just breaks down our reality um, as, you know, Black females in this country but also the fear that we have for our brothers as well. Now, I understand you two started the podcast as a way to talk about what was happening in sports, especially in the college and professional ranks. Of course, we haven't had any sports to talk about with the COVID-19 pandemic, but you're seeing a lot of athletes say something about what has happened, WNBA players leading protests, uh, the NFL doing an about face, and the NBA, they were at the forefront of this just a few years ago, and the WNBA as well. I can't forget about the Minnesota Lynx. So from the sports world, what reactions have you seen, and what do you think that says about how serious these last couple of weeks have been? I think from the sports world, you see a lot of WNBA players like kind of kind of taking charge like Natasha Cloud for one she wrote something on um uninterrupted about how she felt about it like how people say they're allies and don't say anything or are acting like they're oblivious to what's going on um you've seen a couple of NFL players uh speak out to the NFL about how they felt that they should have their back more especially when you have a league that's over 50 percent african-americans um you can kind of see how that makes them feel it's kind of just like all right so we're playing for you but you really don't care about us you don't care about our lives you only care about us when we're playing the sport when we're you know producing revenue for fans and for your company but you really don't care about us outside of that yeah and just to piggyback off of what kt said um i think this is giving the athletes a reason to actually come out and say those statements. I think this is something especially NFL players have noticed for a long time. Um, So I think this is giving them a reason to actually step up and speak their minds and kind of not get in trouble for it. uh, If you get what I'm saying. But as far as the WNBA, if you've been watching the WNBA for years, you know that these players, they, they've stood up for what they believed in for the longest time. Um, and now I'm glad that, you know, leagues like the NBA and like the NFL, they're speaking up about it too, um, because it just gives them more power to, to try to change what's going on around the world. And it was revealed just a day or two ago that the NFL's shift in tone about the Black Lives Matter movements and the push for equity was started because one of their video producers went rogue and mm-hmm. sent an Instagram message to, I believe, Michael Thomas and asked, hey, do you want to record this video? And then 
that snowballed and what started as a rogue gesture or rogue action led the NFL to switch things up and even Drew Brees uh, changed his stance after some pressure. But whatever you make of it, it's surprising and revealing that we have this shift in tone even from some of the big boys compared to just four years ago when my home state was last in the news for the wrong reasons when Philando Castile was killed. And four years, it's a long time. And at the same time, it's not that long of a gap when you look at you know, the history of slavery and civil rights and how long it took to address those inequalities. So I wonder if not, there is, not that there is a single turning point, but if what we're seeing represents a shift in the way we view uh, treatment towards Blacks and other people of color. Um, are you saying just in regards to like the NFL trying to fix it or just mean in general? I can go in any direction with this uh, because I'm trying to observe and understand as much as I can because admittedly when the Black Lives Matter movement started, there was a part of me that said, what, what are you doing or why are you doing this? And over time, as we saw more incidents involving uh, black men and women being killed senselessly, the more you understand why you're seeing protests and why we're seeing the large gatherings that we have over the last couple of weeks. I will say I do appreciate you admitting that because there's a lot of people who are kind of just like, oh, yeah, I've never thought that. I've always been an ally. But I, 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 I do respect you for saying, oh, I didn't know, you know, what it was about. And I do respect you for taking the time to actually educate yourself on about what the BLM movement is, because there's a lot of people who are kind of just still where you used to be in regards to that kind of just like, oh, well, I don't understand why they're doing this or this kind of, you know, kind. I guess trying to, in, in a way, not disregard what it is that we were going through or talking about, but in a way kind of just belittle it. So I do commend you for like actually like, you know, learning about it and saying, yeah, I didn't know what it was. I used to be that person. But that, you know, that's a sign that you can no longer be that person. You can actually learn and, and figure out like okay yeah these people are being oppressed and we're seeing it in our own back door yeah and uh, just speaking of that I, something that I've been thinking about this week well since we recorded our podcast is kind of when when we take the time to educate people we also have to realize that they're growing they're learning so we have to give them that space to grow and learn we also have to give them that time to grow and learn. Um, you brought up the Drew Brees instance. <laughs> I, me being a Saints fan, I didn't expect anything more from Drew Brees, to be honest, because he said this four years ago, and I knew his stance had changed from then. The thing that I am proud of now from Drew Brees is the fact that the difference between four years ago and now, now, his team took the time to educate him so he could see what his teammates were going through when they walk off the field, when they go home, when they get in the cars. Four years ago, they weren't having that conversation in the locker room. Four years ago, they were just worried about what was going to happen on the field. Now he's actually worried about the people that he go to war with every week. And since then, you can people can say, oh, his PR team is working overtime. People can say, you know, it takes longer than this to change. And I do agree. It, it is going to take more than a couple of hours to change your stance on this. But as long as you you continue to go in the right direction, then I can't really say anything wrong about you, you know, because you're, you're proving to me that you're learning. You're proving to me that you're trying to put action behind your words. Now, if those actions start to, you know, go the other way, then that's a more serious conversation. But to me, as long as you're continuing to learn and you're continuing to, I guess, put the action behind your words, I'm going to be behind you. So. And Reagan, I'm glad you brought that up because sometimes I feel we're too quick to judge when people change their attitude, change their position on things, and folks kind of react as, oh, where were you all this time? But as you alluded to, sometimes you need that incubation period to grow and understand why 
folks like yourselves are speaking out about this. And I think the tipping point for Drew was when he walked back his original comments, the president challenged him and that was enough. And you can say maybe it was PR or how, what have you, whatever the reason, when it came time to make a decision, he stuck with it. He said, yeah, I misspoke yeah. and I understand why people are protesting, why Colin Kaepernick, took a knee all those years ago. And yeah. even that has changed. Back then folks were hurt, taking it as a sign of disrespect toward the flag. And now I think more are comprehending that he wasn't making a statement about the flag. He was making a statement about the treatment of blacks and other people of color and how that treatment can put themselves at a risk that I'll never have to worry about. Yeah, I think if the NFL lets Kaepernick actually get hired, that's when I'll believe Roger Goodell's statements. Because <laughs> right now it's kind of one of those things where it's like, you said that because they came at you, you know what I mean? Not saying that mm -hmm. in regards to what Reagan said before, not saying that people can't change, but it's it's one of those things where it's like, it's kind of like a why now? It's kind of, you know what I mean? Like, how come you guys didn't do this before? Like, this man's been trying to get a job. He's been in shape. He's been ready. But he's been blackballed because of a stance that he has taken. And we saw how long it took Eric Reed to get back in the league for the same stance. Uh -huh. So it's one of those things where if the NFL really wants to do right by this, they definitely should let Colin Kaepernick have a job. And, and, and how, like, they should let teams hire him. Because teams were afraid to hire him because of the backlash. They were afraid that they would get in trouble for it. So I feel like if the NFL really believes in what they said, if Roger Goodell really believes in what they said, then Colin Kaepernick should definitely have a chance to be back in the league right now. Yeah, I agree with that. But I, like I said earlier, I think that it's going to take the action behind it to see if he was really telling the truth or not. Um, I mean, I can say that, you know, I want to be the richest person in the world, but if I'm not out here putting the work in, that don't, like, the statement doesn't mean anything, you know? So... I applaud him for, you know, saying what he said, but until you come out and say, this is what I'm doing to prove that I am serious about this, it, it holds no weight to me. And we'll see how everything unfolds. Of course, we'll have to see if there's a season first and what will happen as far as this pandemic, who knows, because of all the protesting Obviously, we can't social distance in that scenario, so we are going to get a crash course in that aspect, but even health experts were saying this is important because racism itself can present recurring health issues in terms of getting access to care and things like that. Mm -hmm. Now, oh, go ahead, go ahead. I was about to say, it's crazy all this is going on and there's still the pandemic. Like, that was, that, that's the like weirdest thing ever it's already been a weird year but then you have what just happened to george floyd you have people going out and protesting and then you have covid19 on top of it so it's just it's like a weird like a weird 2020 bad sandwich i guess i didn't want to use the word sandwich but that's kind of like the only thing that came to mind because everything's just stacking on top of each other so it's just like a weird time what kind of sandwich are we talking about here, Crystal? <laughs> uh, a bad moldy one that's been left in the sun for like, that's been left in the sun in your car for like four days and you don't know where it is. So you get in your car, you just smell something and you're kind of just like, what does that smell? That's what 2020 has been. A bad moldy sandwich that was left in your vehicle for like three days. You walked yourself right into that one. <laughs> I mean, look. This is the he, these are the kind of analogies I give on our pod too. He he kind of asked for it, so I, you know I, I was gonna leave it as sandwich, but <laughs> I had to had to bring it together. No, that makes sense. <laughs> that that does make sense. It's a bad moldy sandwich, and yeah, not one I'd want to eat. I mean, I <laughs> heck, I'd take tuna right now over a bad moldy sandwich. <laughs> but. Going off the point about COVID, I feel that's one reason why this has been a longer sustaining movement discussion than usual. I remember with Jamar Clark and Philando Castile in my home state of Minnesota, 
you had some protests, you had some conversations for maybe a week, and then people moved on. And Cheryl Reeve, I think, was quoted recently saying that's what happened. And she is determined as heck to change that this time around. Of course, we all remember what the Minnesota Lynx did to honor Philando Castile, Alton Sterling, and five Dallas police officers who were killed in an ambush attack. But it created some backlash for a time. And what bums me about not having sports is, you know, the Lynx would have done something by now. They would have gotten it uh, out in front of this. But we don't have new movie releases to look forward to, new album releases, concerts, or sporting events. So we don't have anything to distract us from what happened to George Floyd and some of the obstacles that black people and other minorities face as a whole. And so this conversation, this movement has a stage all to itself. Yeah, I mean, even... Even video games, for example, like 2K, they turned their game off, I think it was like two to three hours in protest Uh of what was going on. Call of Duty didn't release like a newer update because of what was going on. And and if you turn their screen on, you see Black Lives Matter. I know Apple Music did a Black Lives Matter protest. So all the things that, which I don't think it's a problem, like all the things that we would use to distract us are big on what's going on. And they're kind of like, look, we understand that you use this as an escape, but we have to realize that this is a reality that black people are dying. Black people are dying at the hands of racism. Black people are dying at the hands of police brutality. So I feel like things that would normally distract us, telling us what's going on is good for people who are oblivious to what's going on. Because we can easily turn on a PlayStation, Xbox, whatever, and get away, which is okay sometimes. You know, you need that. But like for you to to get on it and make it seem like as if nothing's happening i'm glad that they're kind of in your face like no like this is happening because it's not happening to you doesn't mean it's not happening like this is actually something that's going on to a certain uh a certain people and we want you guys to know like this is a reality for them and this is something that you should you guys should be aware of yeah and the, the, the statement that I'm about to say can either be taken as <laughs> kind of ignorant or you can see it from my point of view, so I'm going to say it anyways. Um, I, I'm a firm believer that everything happens for a reason. I'm not saying that George's death was like, I'm not saying that that was, that was a good happen. thing here. Yeah, I'm not saying that. I'm not saying that COVID is a good thing here, but I'm saying that it's not a coincidence that these two things collided um, within each other. Um, I think, you know, that COVID being here is definitely the reason that this has lasted for so long. But I also just think people from my community are just tired. I mean, this is something that we've been, I'm 23. This is something that I've known for 23 years now. Like, it's, it's, it's nothing new. This is something that my mom has known growing up. This is something that my dad knew growing up. So it's, I think everyone is just on the breaking point. And something that's different from the older generation to my generation is our fuses are a little bit low. Like our, our stands, are, they're, they're lower. So it, it doesn't take much to get us riled up, you know? And I think that could be a good thing or that could be a bad thing. In this instance, I think that's a good thing because we don't want any more deaths like this. We don't want any more hashtags, you know? We we want justice and hopefully we get it. And on that note, Reagan, you mentioned how you and I imagine Crystal and so many others have had to go through this cycle again and again. So when you first learned about George Floyd amidst this backdrop of all of these other people who turned into hashtags, people who should be with us. And I've even said that an alleged forgery should not lead to your death when you consider the nature of it. But you know, you two have done what you can and just keep fighting to make sure voices like yours are heard. And so when this broke out, how did you react to it? And how do you keep this perhaps from overwhelming you because I imagine it's not easy to have to go through that cycle of emotions every time an incident like this comes up in the news. Um, 
I was actually, I think, coming home from work that day, and I kept um, seeing something about a video that was on a timeline. I didn't know what was going on. I, I was just at work. I was minding my business. And then I actually came across the video, but I came across, I guess, like the shortened version that was explaining what had happened instead of like the whole, I think it was seven minute version. And then I ended up watching that one after. Um, It was very sickening, very, it, it brought a lot of anxiety on me, honestly, because I have older brothers. I have a, a father. And it's one of those things where it's like, that could have been them just walking in a store and somebody could have accused them of doing something. And the next thing you know, a, a knee is on my brother's neck. You know what I mean? So it's one of those situations where it's just like, you get tired of it. it it's it's sad. Like, you, you kind of look at it and you're just like, not again. And then you're kind of just like, it, it bothers you because those other cops definitely could have stepped in and prevented it from happening, but they didn't. So it's one of those things where they see something wrong, but they want to use their abuse of power and they think that what they were doing is right. And I think that was the the most frustrating thing about it. It's just like, you guys definitely could have prevented this guy from dying. And the fact that nobody did anything, I think that's the other thing that hurt the most. It's like, this man was just going to the store and he allegedly forged something we don't know. And even, I agree with you, even if he did, you don't kill this guy for that. Like, that's not an offense that you should be killed for. And he was complying, which is the other thing you can get killed for complying they tell us to always comply they tell us to always listen but we've seen countless times it doesn't matter how much you comply no matter how much you listen you're gonna get shot anyway and i think that's the scariest thing like there's a certain anxiety this is this happened to me the other day i was coming back from the store and a cop was behind me i got anxiety when the cop was just behind me he was just minding his business but it's just one of those things where it's like you never know if you're gonna get pulled over like i have my tag i'm waiting for my new tags to come he could have pulled me over for my tags and i would have been scared like yo like i could get shot for not having an up-to-date registration on my tag my car yet so it's just the small things like that that i think that a lot of people don't understand that actually gets you going that gets your anxiety up you're you're kind of just like yo like i could be next at any moment yeah um i don't even i don't know where i was when i watched the video I was probably at home, to be honest, but um, when I saw it, the first thing that I thought of was just, like, again, like, it, it happened again as we're dealing with, you know, everything else that's going on with Breonna Taylor and... Um, and Amar Aubrey. Yeah, yeah. I was going to say Aubrey, like, that was... <laughs> I knew, yeah, I, I, I could tell. <laughs> um, but, yeah, it's, it's kind of, like, we're dealing with two other hashtags here, two other people who should still be with us, two other people who didn't deserve to die at all for, you know, sleeping and going jogging. Um, and, and now we have someone else who, who has died from someone who is supposed to be protecting him. So it's, it's, it was a lot. And I think the first thing that I felt was kind of like, it was, I don't know, it, it was probably a mix between just anger and just, like, confused. I don't know why I was confused, because, like, I've seen that, I've, I've seen it before. But I think just every time you see it, it's kind of just, like, why? You, like, you ask that question, why? And you, you won't get an answer. And then I saw his fellow cop protecting him in front of him. And I was just like, dude, like, you could have stopped him. And then as the days go on, you see the picture of three cops holding him down instead of just that one. And you're just like, four people killed one guy. It took four people to arrest one guy and then to murder one guy. And my thought process when I see someone get pulled over is always, why do you need two police cars? Why do you need four people to check on one person in a car? That's always been my thought process because it's kind of like at that point, are you really fearing for your life or are, are you just, I'm not going to curse here, but are, are you just legit just being a B right now? Like <laughs> you're the one that's strapped up. You're the one that pulled them over. I don't know. It's, it's just, it's like, just use your words. Words get you a long way in this world. Just use your words. And I, it, no, it's funny that you said something about the, like, the four cops for one. I remember I got, um, I was late to school and I guess I parked in like the wrong parking spot. And there was like, at first there was one plain clothes cop, 
was turning into 10 and I'm like, I'm in my car. Like, I was like, look, I, I was like, I'm trying to go to class. I have nothing here but a backpack. They did that just to give me a ticket. And they were, and first of all, and this is the part that tripped me out, it's daytime. Why do you have a flashlight in my car? It's daytime. You can see through my window. I'm literally trying to go to class. I'm not trying to do anything. And it took 10 of them just to give you one ticket. And it's it's the the weirdest thing. And these were like plain clothes. I guess I, I guess they were just trying to get ticket quotas or something. And it was just the weirdest thing. Like I was in class actually just shot that day. I think I probably failed my test too. Probably because I wasn't in the right mental state. But it's just it's weird that you need that many cops for one person. And I was just like, I'm a female that's not gonna harm anybody. I'm literally just late for class. Like, what's the problem? And then they had like it was a whole bunch of dudes that just like one female. And then the sometimes the female cops are the worst because they want to, especially when they see another female, they want to assert a kind of dominance. But it's just like I'm not even here for all that. Like, I'm literally just trying to get to class. Like, I just want to just like give me my ticket and yeah. so I can go. And I had to go like, to court over that ticket which is the worst thing. I was in my school parking lot and I had to go to work over that, I mean, to, to court over that ticket. And then even the court person was like, why are you here? And I'm like, look, I just came because they told me to come. Like, <laughs> that's why I'm here. I don't want no problems. I don't want no records or nothing. But they kind of just dismissed the ticket and I was able to go home. So I'm just, I remember it was raining that day. Like I had to drive all the way to downtown in the rain for a ticket that they was like, whatever, like, Man, it, I, I mean, it was it was, it was probably the most one of the most stressful days I had. And as you two are sharing this story, let's not forget the day before Floyd's death, Amy Cooper, the video in New York where she tried to frame a black guy who told her about the dog or leashing her dog, and then she called nine one one, and obviously it was proven to be false. So you have that on top of this, where someone is aware of her privilege and tried to use it for illegitimate means. Now she got fired from her job and I imagine uh, she's, the repercussions are gonna be pretty severe for months and years to come. But the fact that someone tried to take advantage of the current dynamics, that's just bizarre. I, it ha I think that happens a lot too. Like that, that's the other scary thing about it is they could somebody can call the cops on you for for doing nothing and turn it to something and you don't know if the cop is going to be on your side or if the cop's going to be with them especially because of how we look so that right there is could be a death sentence within his own like luckily nothing happened with that luckily he's okay but it it's it's you we see it too much like getting the cops called on you for selling water getting the cops called on you for barbecuing getting the cops called on you for like honestly just doing the most mundane thing just being and i think that's the other scary part about it like we could be walking down the street and somebody can say we fit a description and then next thing you know we're in handcuffs or something we don't even know what's going on about yeah i remember i remember growing up um my grandma the my grandma had this man across the street from her and we we bought a hoop for her house and we would bring it to the street because she lived on the hill. So the, we could play in the driveway. So we would just bring it down to the street and we would just play basketball in the street. It was me, my uncles, my brothers, just all of us, just, you know, just trying to play around with each other. Every single time that we did it, the police would show up and we could not, for the life of us, we could not figure out why. We could not figure out why they, how they knew that we were always playing basketball. But they would come by, they would say, you can't play that here. You have to play it in your own yard. I'm just like, but this is like, this is city property. Like what, we're not, we're not causing anyone any trouble. We're not being loud. We're not out here at all times of the night. We just come out here during the day to give us something to do. Come to find out the man across the street from her kept calling the police on us just because we wanted to play basketball on the street. And he would say that we were obstructing traffic. But when any car came by, most likely it was someone that we knew because they were coming into the neighborhood and they would always wave at us and say how we're we doing and we would talk to them and then they would go on about their day. So yeah, I mean, things like that happen probably more often than you think. Um, it just never gets recorded or it didn't used to get recorded before now. Right, as Will Smith, I think it was him who mentioned this quote, 
but I mentioned this in my last show, racism isn't getting worse, it's just getting filmed. And whether or not he said it, you know, the point is still very Very true. true. Mm -hmm. (laughs) And we're seeing that play out too with the protests as well. And, you know, I have to imagine, I wonder what kind of stuff did people get away with as some people were making comparisons to the riots in 68 following Martin Luther King Jr.'s assassination. Obviously, we didn't have uh, cameras on our phones back then, but you wonder just if, if the misconduct that we're seeing now and Buffalo comes to mind or what happened to George Floyd and and it's getting all of us in a rage, what was happening before it was easy to document things in real time? I mean, honestly, unfortunately, the only thing that's changed is they're no longer using hoses and dogs. They're using tear gas and batons. So it's it's the same thing, just because, I guess, newer, new, like newer antics, honestly, the same thing, but just newer ways of doing them. So I, it, I always think about that, like the things that people weren't able to record, the things that people weren't really able to account for it's kind of it's scary because it's like man they probably did way worse things then but nobody could prove that they did it so and you see it all the time like people can't really prove that something happened but it's like i i guess that's why technology is a gift and a curse because yes we can see what's going on but then when we see it we're kind of like like did we like is this is this really what's going on basically it's one of those things like yo like this is really what's happening yeah um i love when crystal says that because it's so true um but i mean they're also still using dogs but well, the, the things that they're the things that they're using now gives them a, a reason to stay back from us they don't have to come close to us when they do it so they don't get it i think i'm going to use this word right affected 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 <laughs> <laughs> um it's okay vows are free here <laughs> by the things that they're using um so they can stand as far back as they would like and they can still launch tear gas they can still launch rubber bullets that by the way aren't rubber. really dangerous they actually yes. feel, they're really they're dangerous covered in rubber and they actually look like bullet uh bullet bill from mario party if anyone knows who that is. <laughs> um things are huge um but yeah you're, they you're gonna they, start a new meme now <laughs> Yeah, but they they use all this stuff so they can stay as far back as possible in their riot gear when people are just peacefully protesting. People are just walking in the street. Um, But yeah, this is, I don't know, it just gives them an excuse to use their power when they shouldn't be. Now, you were sharing a couple of stories about your anxiety or having to deal with being judged over the color of your skin. Do you remember the first time where you ran into that or you encountered that Um, event and what your feelings were when you discovered that there were people who looked at you differently? I was literally talking to Reagan about this yesterday. Um, What, okay. So one particular instance was a basketball game and we, I was playing, it was an actual like, competitive game like referees and everything and we were we were breaking off this chick's team and she was hispanic and she called me the n-word and i probably shouldn't have did what i did i mean i ended up pushing her on a fast break the next play but i was i was younger then i don't know like if that was the right way to go about it but that was just the best way i knew how to go about it at the, at the moment because it's one of those things where it's like yo we're playing in a game and you're mad because you're losing. So you just thought it would be fun to fire off that word. And I told my coaches and everybody and my mom why I did it. And nobody was really mad at me. They're like, we understand. Like, they, everybody knew I didn't get a tech or anything. I think the ref must have knew too because he let it like, and it was, it was a hard push. Like, I came way back here with it and was just like, ugh. Like, I pushed the life out of her purposely. I knew I was going to do it. Like, I was sitting on the the like when the when the ball when it was a timeout i already knew i was like i'm finna push her like i already had my mind set up that i was about to push this girl and i did and again i'm not saying that it was right but when you're kind of younger you really don't know how to ex- express something like that you're just like yo like 
I just got called a racial slur. What do I do? So I pushed her. But I mean, I have experienced things beforehand, like being followed around in stores, um, having like, uh, like I, I, I believe there was one where we were in a, a class um, and this wasn't the teacher who did it. We were in a class and we were learning about we were watching some movie and we were learning about Africa and every time like there would always be people looking at me every time like a black person came on screen or like a racial slur was said they look at me and I'm just like it's a movie like it's a documentary where we're watching something you don't have to you don't have to let me know that I'm black I know <laughs> like I've been black my whole life so it's one of those things where it's like we're watching a movie about something historical they say something racial yes they said a racial slur yes I know what it means. You don't have to keep looking over at me every time to see if I'm going to do it. It's just like, I get it. I know what that means and I get it. Yeah. Um, sorry if my screen just went black for a second. My mom was calling me. <laughs> um, but the first time, man, it was, I, I'm pretty sure it was when I was playing tennis. So I grew up I started playing tennis when I was four. Yeah, I think I started playing when, playing when I was four. Um, my first tournament ever was in India. Yeah, it was in Indiana. <laughs> and this little girl that I was playing, I was, I just remember I was, I, I felt like I was Serena Williams out there. Like I was just, I was just whooping up on the little girl. And then all of a sudden she she gets hurt. And so I go over there, I'm just like, okay, are you okay? Like, what's wrong? Just me caring about her. And she kept saying it was her ankle. And so I tried to lift her up and she was like, don't touch me. And I was just like, <laughs> I, I just, I, I kind of just stepped back from her. I was just like, okay, I'm just trying to help you get to the bench. She was just like, no, don't touch me. And she called me the N word. I was just like, okay, cool. And so her parents came down or whatever. I'm just sitting on my other side. I'm drinking my Gatorade. All of a sudden, she comes back on the court. And this is the part of me that I, like, this is the part that I wish I didn't do. I wish I would have kept doing what I was doing. But because I thought she was hurt and her parents were forcing her to continue to play tennis, I was just like, okay, I'm going to take it easy on her. I took it easy on her. And she ended up beating me. Mm. To this day, I, I wish that I would have just kept playing the way that I was playing. But once again, I was young. Like, I literally just told you, I started playing tennis when I was four. So I was young. I, like, I, I didn't, to me, that word didn't really resonate with you. Yeah, it, it, it didn't, I don't know, it just, it didn't affect me the way that it probably should have. But then once I got to high school, I went to a, a private high school that, claimed that they were diverse but kind of really wasn't um we were playing I was playing basketball and I was playing we were playing against one of our rival schools and one of their fans called me the n-word and I was just like okay bet it was like it ain't gonna be like that tennis tournament that, that I went to that day and I'm pretty sure I came out and I, and I kicked their butts to be honest and then every time I would score I looked at them and after the game he came up to me. He was like, "I'm sorry for what I said. It was in the heat of the moment." I was just like, "No, mm, cool. nah, mm. you meant that." He meant, yeah, that. you meant that. You meant yeah, that. Meant that. But that, I mean, know. those are just those are just two of the instances where I could feel it. And there have been plenty of more where, Kate, like KT said, where you're in class and you read the book and the word comes up, or you're talking about slavery and history, <laughs> and you're the only black person in the room, and everyone looks at you, and the teacher calls on you the most because he thinks that you know, like, you know the most about <laughs> that's, slavery. Like, that's the worst when they call you the most. You're just like, yo, like, what are you trying to say right now? Like, I'm not the one that's being paid to teach this class. If you want to give me your salary, I, let me let me teach it then. But no, I, I remember the teacher was like, "How do you feel about slavery?" And I was just like, "What?" <laughs> like, <laughs> like, what do you think? For real, like, I was like, what you mean? How do I feel about slavery? Like, oh, I thought it was great. Like, is that what you want me to say? Like, come on now. Like, he really, really asked that. And then everybody was looking at me just like, and I'm like, why don't you ask one of them <laughs> how they feel about it? Like, come on. Either that or 
tell the teacher, go find a DeLorean, travel back in time to the slavery period and see and see what life was like. Now, I no, wasn't there. I can't. Of course. Yeah. What, <laughs> I can't yeah. speak from experience, but I'm going to go out there and say it wasn't a good thing. Or, or exactly. when people do like those games, like what time period would you want to travel back to? And it's like, I don't have that many good options. <laughs> I'm black. Do you know that we're not, <laughs> like we're barely accepted now. What do you want me to, like, where am I supposed to go? <laughs> They're like, do you want to travel back to this time? It's like, I can't. Do you not realize what I look like? <laughs> That's not going to work out for me. I, I may travel there, but I'm not coming back. I don't think you understand. Like, <laughs> I don't think you understand. I can't, there's not many options that we can realistically go. Well, Crystal, I, you could always go back to uh, 2001, 2002, or 2016 if you oh. know where I'm going with this. Yeah, LA Sparks, the best franchise in the history. <laughs> By the way, and we're speaking to a Minnesota Lynx fan. I just want to say whoever's watching this is a Lynx fan. I mean, I don't hate y'all, but thank you for letting us beat you in 2016, even though you didn't let us. That was just pure skill. But yeah, you know. Lynx got the upper hand in 2017, though. And yeah, so. I don't remember that. <laughs> you, I don't oh, that I do. It didn't happen. It didn't happen. I don't think that happened. It didn't happen. It's not a real year. And even though we joke about it, as we mentioned earlier, you know, it was the Lynx who made the first move and said, let's do something about what we're seeing. And this time around, as we discussed earlier, a lot of key faces in the WNBA have something to say about it now. And I don't know specifically because I don't follow the teams that closely, but Crystal, what is your home team? What have they said about George Floyd and the recent uh, they, protests? They released a statement. Um, a lot of the players have come out on Instagram and posted pictures and released their own statements as well. Um, Christy Tolliver was actually in the protest in DC. Um, so a lot of the players have been pretty proactive in, in what they've been doing. And I think, I think when you have a league that's 80% uh, black, like Natasha Cloud stated yesterday, I think you, it's important for the players of color and not just the players of color, but just players in general to speak out about it because, I mean, that is most of the league. Like, their product is mostly black women. So it's kind of like if there was no black woman in the league, I'm not really sure how popular it would be. Like, not trying to say that people who aren't black aren't skilled because that's not what I'm saying. But I'm just saying, like, because you have so many black women and so many black women are popular players in the league, it's kind of just like, where would the league be without them? Yeah. <clears throat> I mean, <laughs> I don't I don't have a hometown team, which I am very sad about, <laughs> but um, I cheer for the Sparks. Um, and every team in this league has said a statement. Um, but I think the more important thing is every team has allowed their players uh, to come out and speak out about it. Um, and I, I appreciate the WNBA for that. They They let their players be the voice of the league. Um, with no, you know, no regrets, uh, no consequences. Well, I'm sure there's consequences, but like none that we've seen because the league has backed the players up um, every time that they, that every time that they've spoken up about something. Um, so that's just the part that I am appreciative of, um, of this league and all the teams. And I think we should clarify every choice has consequences, but some are positive ones. And yeah. that is a notable change from four years ago when the league wasn't sure how to respond to all of this. You probably recall they tried to find players for wearing the Black Lives Matter t-shirts or taking a knee, things like that. And eventually they relented. Uh, some have thought the league hasn't done enough to make a statement, but as you said, that just the fact that they're allowing players to speak their mind and not try to reel them in, not try to cast a net over them is a notable change from four years ago. I think there is a better understanding of what's going on. And yeah, I, I'm sure we would have heard about this eventually, but I go back to four years ago and the links 
being the first ones to speak out about it. It helped, I think, that they had the first game, but then other teams, other players saw what they did and then decided to make a statement on their own. So the Lynx, not only have they won four championships, but they deserve credit for helping bring this conversation into the limelight for the sports world. I, I think um, the worst part of that was, was like when the black players started to protest, a lot of people were not so nice in their social media comments. Um, in particular, a lot of the Sparks players, they got it the worst. Um, there was even at one game, and I think they released it on their social media, but at one game they released this like video of them wearing all black and they released like a whole bunch of comments that were said to them and they were there were some things on there that you're just like yo this cannot be i believe that video was released in like 2017 2018 i don't remember the year but you're like yo like this has to be from the 1960s like some of that stuff was i don't know if it was like a mixture of trolls if it was people who were being serious but my thing is, is like if you're trolling like that then that's probably really how you feel because one thing I've always learned is that the three people in this world that tell the truth are kids, junk people, and angry people. And like when people are angry, they will let you have it. And you're just like, yo, I didn't know you felt like that. <laughs> like, I didn't know that you felt that way about me. So it's one of those things where it's like, you don't know if it was just somebody who was trolling, which I feel like you don't troll in that capacity. But it, it was, they were, there was some stuff in there that was really reckless. And I kind of, I'm I'm happy that they were able to push through and move from that because some of those words were just, they weren't even talking about me and I felt the way on some of those comments. And I was just like, I don't know how they were able to move past that and continue to be professional, continue to play after that. Yeah. I remember, I remember that video, man. That's crazy. That's wild that it was four years ago. Yeah. It um, quite quick. <laughs> but yeah, I, the the links do have i mean they they deserve a lot of um credit for you know standing up for what's right um because that that was huge that was that was really huge and it's just it's crazy to me to think that there are fans of this league um who feel that way or who felt that way hopefully <laughs> yeah. um, <laughs> um at that time especially considering that you you follow a league where the the people that play in the league are already oppressed because of their gender. And now you're talking about the people who are oppressed also because of their skin tone um, or, yeah, or, or their race. Um, it's just, it's wild to think about now. Like back then, I don't think I was thinking the way that I'm thinking oh, now. Yeah. I don't think I thought kinda, about it. I love that word that you said, they're oppressed because of their gender. Like that's, yeah. a, I didn't even think of that at the time. Like, well, and you look Man. at the ratings and the commentary, and so it, it, the treatment, and I'd say oppressed, it's pretty clear because that that league's been around for almost 25 years, and they're still dealing with trolls, haters, and just mm -hmm. trying to get a platform that other leagues, well, the XFL and the AAF, for example, had all of these TV contracts and this big platform, mm -hmm. and those leagues, now the XFL had to deal with COVID, but they didn't make it a year. And yet you had all these networks going out to them and the WNBA mm -hmm. it, it's making progress and the women's game is too. But at the same time, going to your remarks, there's still a ways to go. Yeah. You don't, you don't see those same opportunities that you see for um, male leagues as in, like you said, XFL or AFL or whatever it, it was. AAF or something like that. Something like that. But <laughs> Um, yeah, you don't see you don't see those same opportunities. And once again, all you hear is, "Oh, I don't want to watch basketball where there are no dunks. I don't want to watch basketball that's slow. I don't want to watch fundamental game." But yet, you watch the Spurs every time they're in the playoffs, or well, you it's the one too, Reagan. I don't want to watch women if it's not sexy or whatever that was at one point. It's just like watching a sport is not supposed to be sexy <laughs> like you're watching these people compete for something you you watch guys run around in tight pants and pads <laughs> and get hit makes me question <laughs> just saying well earlier you talked about the difficulties 
going back in time, if you were to choose a period, and I completely understand that feeling, is there a period if you were to go back, and because it hasn't been pleasant, but there have been a lot of pivotal moments that have at least helped us inch forward. And as we've seen in the last couple of weeks, we still have a long road to traverse here. But if you had an opportunity to go back in time and you know maybe use it as an opportunity to educate yourself, I don't know, but That's... what would you consider just knowing the circumstances? Uh... Where would you go back to? A time period. Well, I'm just gonna pick 2008 when Obama was elected. That's probably like the only place I would actually go back to, even though it's not that far. But like, because I don't. I mean, honestly, being a black person, we don't have that many options. So I'm just gonna say 2008, and I was about like, well, I'm finna age myself, y'all. I believe I was a freshman in high school at the time. I'm only doing this because I know Reagan liked to call me old, even though I'm only 27. But, like, I might have been a freshman in high school at the time, if, if my memory serves me correct. And I remember we, wa we, we actually watched that. Um, we actually watched that in my history class. I, I, I can't think of the word right now. The um, inauguration. There we go. We actually watched the inauguration in my history class. And, like, everybody in the class, was, we, we were just like, yo, like, this is happening. Like, we're so excited especially people of color, we were like, yeah, we can do this. Like, we've always been told that a black person would be present, but we actually seen it. Like we actually lived through that time. So to go from that elation to now, and I'm, I'm not saying like we didn't have our problems then, but to see where we were and then kind of to see it back, it's kind of like a scale. Like we're now at the bottom of the scale. We're just like, yo, we were so high. And then now all of a sudden we're here and we wanted to come from where we were and we were we were on a high for a little bit, but now we're back to at the bottom. And it's one of those things where it's like, how did we get here so fast? Yeah. Um man, that's a hard question. Not many, not many options for us. <laughs> Honestly, in this as crazy as it seems, I would go back to the civil rights um era. Only because only so I could, so I could have a conversation with Martin Luther King. Like that is the only reason that I would want to go back there. Um, being from Memphis, of course, the city where he got assassinated. I used to be ashamed to say that, by the way. Um, <laughs> <laughs> but being from Memphis um, and being able to, I mean, just having the um, Arain Motel, which is the place where he got assassinated, just in your backyard, is. It's a weird, cool feeling, I guess, if you want to explain it that way. Um, like taking field trips there every year when you're in elementary school, just to get the history of everything that was going on in that point in time. Um, it's, it's kind of empowering um, to know that someone with such a big name was in your city at one point. And now you have this whole memorial there to kind of celebrate him. Um, but at the same time, like I said, I used to be embarrassed to say that I was from Memphis because someone there felt like they had the right to take down the most powerful person in the world that day. And it's, it's just, it's, it's crazy. But yeah, I would want to have a conversation with him. But also, if I had a second choice, I would go back to the day right before Trump got elected. Mm and just make sure to tell people more than I was then to vote because we shouldn't be in the situation that we're in right now. I remember when he got elected, I live, my apartment complex is very diverse. I heard so many people crying, literally outside my apartment that day. And it was, it was one of the worst feelings. Cause it's like, you want to ask people if they're okay, but you can't do anything. You're just yeah. like, yo, I can't do anything. We're, we're literally stuck. Like we can't, we couldn't do anything. It felt like you're trying to walk in some really thick mud, but your legs are moving, but nothing's happening. Like that's literally what it felt like. And it was just like, yo, like we can't do anything. And it like, I had a, a pain in my stomach just because like, I knew how I felt, but to hear other people feel that way, but you can actually hear it. It was one of those things where you're just like, yo, like this is really our reality now. This is really what's going on. And then the worst that we feared some some of the things we feared didn't happen, 
thankfully, thank God. But like when it comes to a lot of stuff that happens. So you're kind of just like, yo, like this happening. And, and it's crazy because we're seeing the worst end of it and election time's coming up. So I know I'm voting. I'm, I'm already, I was going to vote anyway, but I'm definitely voting now because this, we, we just, that's one of the ways that we can beat anything that's going on is it's definitely by putting the right people in office. Yeah. I remember the, remember the night that it came out. I was in college. I was living in apartments on campus and I lived across from the baseball boys. They would, they always throw parties and everything. So we could always hear everything that was going on in the apartment. The moment that it came up that he won, the only thing I heard outside of my window was them cheering oh, okay. and saying, yeah, let's go grab some girls by the, mm-hmm. Wow. And after that, I was just like, I was, after that, I'm pretty sure I went and I grabbed a bottle of wine <laughs> and I just chugged half of it. I was just like, okay, wow. now it's time to sleep. That's crazy. That's crazy. But, yeah. People would 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 praise that like that's and, and, and like i don't know if we discuss it here but he really made racists feel like oh yeah we have a platform now because like yeah. racism was always there they just kept that hidden but now they got that power and they're like oh yeah we can say what we want now because trump endorses this but it's just like it's it's like nah like it, it you first of all you shouldn't be thinking things like that and second of all it's just like that's not even cool like what if your exactly. sister or your mother was one of those people that got grabbed by what I'm not, I'm not going to say that on <laughs> yeah. the show, but yeah, like, what if that was your sister or your mom? Like, would you be cheering then? That's not, that's not even cool. That's not funny. That's something that's not a joke at all. Yeah. Well, I'm glad you offered your input. And as you said, not a lot of options as far as time periods, but I feel with your perspective, the two of you aren't afraid to say, yeah, it ain't pretty, but there are moments or opportunities or just ways we, things we can learn from, from the time periods you spoke of. And we'll see what the rest of 2020, 2021 brings. I know I've joked about just jumping forward with Please. <laughs> my work because <laughs> I've been, I've been idle for three months now, uh, but I'd rather be bored than sick. Uh, so have I know the two of you have mentioned your work in sports I know the two of you I know Crystal I know you've played basketball I think through high school for sure and I think college Reagan I'm not sure what your background is but uh, just as athletes whether it's past or present how do you think that has shaped your perspective when it comes to discussions of racism and equity and and this worldwide response with George Floyd? Um, I think, I think it's, I, I think it's one of those things where it's kind of like, all right, um, you see these black athletes, they're, they're, they obviously love what they do. A lot of them love what they do. You can't take that away. But sometimes it's hard to get out there and do what you love when you have people who don't appreciate you doing it. So you can take into account, like a lot of Boston fans, I've heard a lot of stories about black people playing in Boston, not wanting to play in Boston ever again, because their fans are, they're, for the lack of a better term, prejudice. <laughs> I mean, I could say racist, but I don't want to, you know, I'm not going to go all the way to the racist needle yet, but there's been a lot of athletes. There was a, um, a story yesterday, I forgot the baseball player's name, but he basically was saying he had a no trade clause to Boston because of that. And he said, Tory Hunter. There we go, Tory Hunter. He was basically saying every time he's been to Boston, he's always been called N words, he's been called racial, other racial slurs. So he was just like, I'm, I'm, not, I'm not going to Boston. You could trade me anywhere but Boston. And that, that says something like, you're, you're out here being like when you're in any league, you're the top athlete of whatever sport it is, whether you're the last person on the bench or you're the star, you're the top athlete of whatever sport it was. Like you are one of the lucky few that got picked. So you're out here doing what you love. You're out here, you're, you're living your dream. And then you have someone who doesn't appreciate you and they decide to call you whatever word for whatever reason, because they feel like, Oh, I'm going to get in where it hurts. It's just like, I just don't feel like you should treat people that way. I don't think that you, cause you, they wouldn't want to be called, 
something out of their name, whether it's racial or anything other than that, like while they're at work, it, it makes you uncomfortable. It makes you realize like, I don't know if I want to keep doing this. So when people like Jackie Robinson kept going forward, when people like Tori Hunter kept going forward and vice, like, you know, so on and so forth, it's one of those things that shows you a, a, like a certain amount of strength that this person has. Like I could quit right now, but they don't because they love the sport too much to let whatever person, whoever said anything to turn them from, their lifelong dream i mean it was already hard to get there so i'm not going to let you stop me from getting there but i think people have to put that in consideration it's just like that's not funny nor is it cool like we're out here performing for you and this is basically how you treat us i hate the word i hate the phrase performing for you well yeah but, but oh, that was just no but i yeah no, i get what yeah, you're saying yeah um i think me growing up in sports i mean i played I played tennis, I did ballet, I ran track, I played basketball, I played softball. I've done it all, pretty much. Um, I've been around all types of people. Um, so I think that exposed me to a lot of things, a lot of different cultures. Um, but at the end of the day, it also gave me lifelong friends and I think I picked some good ones from it. Um, but I do respect the professional athletes out there. Um, I get it, you know, studying sports business management. I, I get the business side of decisions. I get the emotional side of decisions. And I just get the stupid decisions, too. Um, <laughs> um, we've all made them. But um, the fact that these athletes are brave enough to come out and speak out um, about what's going on, you know, it, it loses – it could lose them sponsorship money. It could lose them fans. It could – it takes money out of their pocket, literally, when they open their mouths and, you know, don't shut up and dribble. Um, so I get it. I get the hesitation and I applaud them for coming out and speaking out, although it's what they should do. Um, but, you know, they could be quiet. So I, I applaud them. Now, Crystal, going back to the story you shared about fouling the athlete who called you the N-word, <laughs> did she mess with you after, after that? Um, response you made no but you know what years later we ended up being teammates in college for a little bit so that is the part that I thought was always weird she did apologize but I was kind of just like like Reagan when the person apologized to her I'm kind of just like I don't know how I can accept that but then you find it weird because now she's married to a black dude so it's just like does he know that that's what you used to say? Like, does he know that that's what you were calling people? You know what I mean? So it's it's like, it was like a weird thing. It, it's one of those things where it happened so long ago, but you never forget that. You never forget if somebody called you that. You never forget the situation that made a person call you that or whatever the case may have been. So we never mentioned it. Because one thing that I know is you don't have to be friends with who your teammates are. You just have to be able to have a certain amount of respect so you guys can get the job done. So like, I wouldn't say we were friends. I would say we were cordial, but it was one of those things where it's like, I feel weird that you're apologizing to me this, like about this now, which means that you had time to think about it and really like, you, you probably did change and you probably like, yo, this is wrong. But it's just like, if you knew it was wrong, you shouldn't have said it then when you, when you did that. So uh, after the game, no, she didn't say nothing to me after like, ever and then when we like years later because the basketball world is so small when we end up having to be teammates for a little bit she never said nothing about that ever again either so it's one of those situations where it's like it it's weird like it came full circle and I think there was a reason for that I feel like maybe that was her way of trying to learn and try to teach or or, or I guess try to learn but it was just it, it for it was awkward a little bit but it wasn't because I feel like she felt more awkward that she called me that than than I did when it first transpired but it was just a a crazy situation. Now, who are some people that you looked up to or who helped you understand the barriers, the obstacles, just the, the environment that you have to deal with whenever you get <laughs> boiled up? Who are some folks that you look up to for inspiration as far as moving the discussion about racism and equal treatment? Um, one of them was one of them was my mom because she was born in Alabama and definitely seen all of that and was able to 
um, get out of that by, you know, military, college, all the other stuff, all these other great things. My dad, too, my dad's from New Orleans. So I have two Southern parents who had to grow up with with being around situations like that. And they were able to kind of just figure it out and, and not let them, not let that push them. Um, I mean, those are the first two that come to mind right now, but I'm pretty sure like there's more, but those are like the, for me, those are the biggest ones because they actually lived in the South during a time where a lot of this was going on. Like my mother was born in 65. So you can imagine how it was growing up, like from like the the late 60s, 70s, to to on like you can kind of imagine how that was for her um i mean growing up in the south <laughs> it's it's fun it's 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 fun growing up here um but i like kt said i i look up to my mom and uh, my dad basically for that both military both traveled the world pretty much and they've seen it from different sides i mean when you can go to a place and they think that you're Charles Barkley and they start giving you money and sponsorship deals to model socks and stuff. You I feel Barkley. like, <laughs> <laughs> I mean, th- that just explains it. A lot of people see black people as the same. Um, yeah. You, you got, you tall, you kind of light skin, you got a bald head, you Charles Barkley. <laughs> That's just how they see it, I guess. Um, but yeah, my mom and my dad are definitely uh, some people that I looked up to. And how do you keep yourself from getting overwhelmed when you see deflating news, seeing the video with George Floyd, or being reminded of all the others who were killed, who should still be with us? How do you make sure it doesn't blow your psyche? Oh, that's a good question. Um for me i try to i mean we're still in a pandemic so gyms aren't open because most of the time i'll just go and and play basketball but because the gyms aren't open here yet um listening to music is one um writing is another um like talking to somebody if i really feel like i'm having bad anxiety about something um maybe playing a game or or just trying to do something that can distract me from like just for a little bit because obviously it's it's always going to be there but just something to take my mind away just for a little bit so just just i guess anything that can really just make me smile or make me think a positive thought or two at the moment yeah um writing is a big one for me music um if i need to talk to someone i mean i go as far as therapy um but a really big one right now, especially being away from home and, I mean, with everything being shut down, not being able to go home. Um, here, my girlfriend has been a big, like, help to me. So I normally, if I'm feeling down, I, I vent or, like, I talk to her and just try to calm myself down that way, get my mind off of it a little bit. And what kind of conversations have you had? I imagine you know, the two of you, of course, had the podcast, but have others reached out? What have they said? And what have you talked to them about as far as how we can change this? Um, there has been a lot of people have, that have reached out just trying to figure out how they can either be an ally or how they can help. And like, like we said in the podcast, I think the biggest thing that helps is realizing you have a privilege and going out there using your privilege to, to help us to realize and be like, yeah, I know I have this privilege, but I also have the privilege to, to help you and turn this around and kind of just realizing like, I, I don't understand what you guys go through, but I still want to help. I feel like there's nothing wrong with saying that you don't understand what we go through, but you want to help. I feel like the only problem is, is when you're, when you're like, there's nothing wrong with you guys. That's when there's a problem. There's nothing wrong with admitting that you don't understand what people of color or black people go through because you're not black. And that's totally fine. But I feel like as long as you're trying to help us and use the privilege to help us, then that's acceptable. But don't just use your privilege and and be oblivious and be like, oh, no, we don't have a privilege. Like, that's not true. I think that's where the problem lies. And I I think, um, and I think Rachel said this earlier, we can try to educate and help. But at the same time, I feel like to a certain point, it's, it's people have to learn to educate themselves as well because we can only give you so much like, yeah, we'll help you, but we can only give you so much. Now, if we give you so much, you still don't understand, then 
I mean, I, I unfortunately it is what it is. You can't really help everybody and force everybody to understand. The only thing you can try to do is help them learn. And if they feel like it's not worth learning, then I mean, what can you really do about it? But there's we we've definitely had a lot of conversations. Like my brother, we had one. Me and my dad have had one. So I, I think it's important to have these conversations, as uncomfortable as they may be. But how else are you going to really, you know, teach awareness and and kind of understand what other people are going through if you don't have those conversations? Yeah, um, I mean, ever since our podcast episode has come out, I've had people I've went to school with, people um, I worked with reach out to me and try to understand. Um, I've had my friends reach out and, you know, try to understand what's going on. And I mean, as soon as we're done with this, my family is actually on a Zoom call um, and talking about, you know, everything that's going on in the world, the protests and just, just just everything, you know, that's going on and how we feel about the situation. Uh, me and my brother have I, kind of been talking about it, um, been sharing things on different platforms. Um, so, yeah, just I've had a lot of people reach out. And I always say this, my job is not to educate you. That's not what I'm here for. But if you approach me and you ask me questions and you ask me, um, you know, to help you, I, I won't turn you down. I will never turn someone down who is trying to learn. And on that subject, what do you make of the protests where every state has held at least one? We're seeing it in small towns as well as big cities. And this has taken hold worldwide. I think yesterday I saw Liz Cambage leading a protest in Australia, Amanda Zowie B in Sweden. And I've seen clips from Britain and New Zealand and Germany and so many countries all having something to say about this. France is another one. What does that tell you as far as how we're moving forward in this discussion? I think that lets us know that there are people watching and understanding what's going on. And I also feel like people, there are people who are trying to make changes by peacefully protesting. And I think that's a beautiful thing. I feel like um, it's it's because people don't realize racism is not just an American thing. Racism spans over everywhere. Uh, and then like Australia, like you said, Australia is is a very racist place in its own. So it just seeing all these other countries and these other um, places just protest like that lets you know, like they feel us. And there's there's I mean, there's black people everywhere you go. Let's just that's first and foremost. There's black people everywhere you go. So they feel it they understand what's going on. They, they're oppressed too, just because they live in London doesn't mean that they're not oppressed. I mean, we may be, you know, we, we may just see more of it in America because we live in America, but there's definitely people in, in other places that feel the same way we feel. So to see different places do protests, I think it's a beautiful thing because it's bringing awareness to everybody and not just to America. Like this racism spans everywhere. Like it didn't just stop and land here. Like it's, it's literally everywhere. Yeah, for someone who's, I mean, I've traveled out of the country a few times. Racism is definitely everywhere. Um, but also as someone who watches soccer, um, you hear the stories all the time of people who play in London, people who play, you know, in Mexico, people, just people who play everywhere um, say that they experienced it on the field. Um, so I think these protests, yes, uh, they are standing with us, but they're also letting their their government know, you know, it's here too. We have to, the same way we're asking the U.S. to step up, we, we got to step up ourselves. So I think, I think it's great. And let's not forget that South Africa had apartheid through the mid-90s. I think it was 95 when they finally uh, abolished it. So you're right. You know, there are countries all over still dealing with, with this and even though folks may love to give us a hard time as you noted this is going on no matter where you are and this is not just uh, an American thing so how can we progress how can we move this conversation forward so we don't have another hashtag for George Floyd or Breonna Taylor or Maude Arbery 
what's the best way to move forward so we don't have to go through this cycle over and over and over. The biggest thing that I could say is have the police start policing themselves and have people who are over the, the police departments hold each other accountable. I feel like the reason why so many of this goes untouched is because the ones who are, the cops that are trying to say, hey, you're doing something wrong, they either get fired. I've heard of stories of cops getting like beaten because they're not um, like taken up for their own. So I feel like if we can get those cops who are afraid to say something to not be afraid anymore, I feel like that's the first step. To get them to police themselves, I feel like that's the biggest thing. Police themselves. I mean, people. a lot of people say more training, but I just, I don't know if that's right. But I do think it's funny, at least in California, that a barber needs more training than a police officer. I feel like that's interesting that in order to learn how to do a fade or braid hair, you need more training than to be a person who's supposed, who's supposed to protect and serve us. I think that's one of the weirdest things in the world. I don't know how somebody who's holding a gun gets less training than a person who's holding a pair of clippers or some scissors. Like, I, I just think that's backwards, but definitely policing themselves is a, a, a great way to start. Yeah. Um, I'm tired of hearing people say good cops should quit because if all good cops quit, then all we have are bad cops. Good cops should just speak up and not get fired for it. Uh, like KT said, um, we definitely need a body to police the police because if they're not being policed, then they're just going to keep doing what they're doing. But also, I think it's important to note that we need more people who are not like us to realize that they have privilege um, and to use that privilege for good and not for bad. Um, you know, we, we didn't, we didn't bring ourselves here. We, we <laughs> didn't force our, we didn't force ourselves to do work outside all day and not be able to go to school and not be, and have to teach ourselves how to read. Like we, we didn't cause this pain up, upon ourselves. So I think it's just holding other people account. Like just, I don't know, just use your privilege for good. Just figure out a way to to do that and to help us fight this fight. Um, like I said on our podcast, it's, it's about doing what's right. And the sooner people realize that it's, it's, it's bigger than race right now, this is about the generations to come after us because unfortunately, I don't know if it's gonna happen in our lifetime, but it's about the generations after us. It, it's about making the world a better place for them. And I don't want my grandkids, if I have children, I don't want my grandkids to have to go through what we're going through right now. And for people like me, what would you recommend as far as education and immersing ourselves in what is happening? We, of course, read about Martin Luther King and Malcolm X, but at the same time, you know, we're having a chance to live through live this in real time, I think is what I meant to say. So what would you recommend so folks like myself gain a better understanding of why you're speaking up, why you guys get upset when you hear about George Floyd and all the others who are no longer with us? Oh, uh, oh ah, that's a good question. Um, I, I don't, ah, that, that could go in so many directions. I don't know, like, I don't know, you kind of threw me for a loop because it's like, I know what we could probably ask of you guys to do, but the thing is, is like, I think for me, the biggest one is just real, like just using your privilege just for the better. I, I think that's the biggest one. I mean, there's so much you guys can do is like, I guess, donating to the cause, using your privilege. Um, the other biggest one is if you see something going on, say something or prevent it from happening before it happens. So if you see someone getting pulled over and you see that they're getting mistreated, just like say, like step up and say something. Don't just let it happen. Um, don't just let people get abused. And, and not even just police brutality, but any type of brutality that you're seeing, whether, it, you know, just literally just anything. If you see something that looks wrong, just step in and say, hey, like you shouldn't be handling this guy or this girl like that, or you shouldn't be doing that to this person or like do you know how bad this looks type of thing uh, that's honestly probably the the best thing that anybody could do is just if you know you have privilege use it and step in and help others yeah 
Um, my biggest thing is also, yeah, we get taught things in school, but um, go deeper than that. I mean, read books, watch movies, go visit these places. I mean, if you've never been to Memphis, once COVID is under control, of course. Um, we can do virtual safety, tours. Yeah, your, your safety is most important. Um, but um, go visit these places. Like I said, Memphis has the Lorraine Motel. Go or the National Civic Rights Museum is what they're calling it now. But go visit that place because just there's nothing like standing in that same spot that MLK was in and just like just seeing the world from his perspective for that just that moment. Or go to Birmingham and visit the church where the little girls were bombed and killed in, or they where they used the fire hose and the dogs. Like there's it's nothing like being in the places where history has happened. Um, I think it makes you understand it a little bit better. I think it gives you more perspective and you just get to see and feel what was happening during that time. So my my biggest advice would be visit those places, read as much as you can. And if you're a visual person, find movies, find videos about it. And don't forget the Selma March, I think, happened not too far from Birmingham. And yep. I think happened in the wake of it, too. Uh, mm -hmm. They made a movie about it, which I watched and enjoyed. <laughs> Mm -hmm. Now, you two have already discussed this on the Unwanted Opinions podcast, but I'm wondering what future plans do you have? Because it's clear that the George Floyd protests aren't going to subside anytime soon. We had a huge gathering in Washington, D.C., and even though things have simmered here as far as rights in Minneapolis, St. Paul, there are still gatherings and protests, so we're still doing our best to make our voices heard almost two weeks later. So do you have any future plans or future talking points on your podcast as we continue to process this movement? We do, but I don't know if we could give it away yet. I mean, should we tell them, Reagan, or should it be kind of just be like, you know? Well, and I asked so that folks who want to watch your podcast or listen to your podcast, uh, if they want to know more about it, that's why I'm asking, yeah. you know, what can yeah listeners expect um, from you two um so of course we we've, we've already given our our episode uh, that we talked about and we had that conversation about um but we we are in the works of putting yeah. together kind of like this conference call panel type episode where we get people of all walks of life to come in and just express how they're feeling about it and come together to try to figure out a bigger solution to what's going on. Um, now, once again, we're in the works about it. So yeah, yeah that's why I was like, I don't know if we want to, you know. <laughs> it's it's <laughs> something that's, it's not a solid plan just yet. Uh, still trying to find people to hop on the panel, but um, just come together, figure out a way to fight this because it is clear that people are just going to continue to label protesters as thugs and, they're gonna say that it, they're riots and everything, which they're not. Um, so just come together, talk about it, and see what actions we can put behind the, our talking points. Yeah, that, that was basically it. She took, yeah, she 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 took it because I was looking for the words for it, and I was like, I don't know if we want to tell them yet because we're still working it out. But yeah, Reagan basically and eloquently and beautifully put that out there like that look at me using big words i know a few of those <laughs> oh so do i but you don't want to lose your audience with jargon as exactly. i've learned over the years exactly uh, so is this going to be a one-time event or do you look at making a series what is this looking like what is this project looking like for the two of you um well right now it was planned to be a one-time event um but honestly we'll make it as long as it needs to be um yeah. i think these are the, the kinds of things that you can't really plan out in advance it's just once it happens it takes a life of its own uh, we normally try to keep our episodes from 45 to an hour long just because after that you kind of kind of lose people a little bit um so if i mean if it needs to be three or four episodes and we're fine with that because once again, this is our platform and this is how we're going to use it. Um, and we also feel like if people are still, you know, looking for education, then we could be that, you know, we could be that tool to help you 
to help educate you while doing something that we also love to do. So, yeah, it, it just depends on how it goes. If if we if there's a need for it to go longer than one episode, then we're fine with that. I mean, who knows? Maybe we'll get because I know she. You know, we our plans is for all perspective, all walks of life. So maybe we'll get people who are pro cops on the show too to see like how they feel about it we would just have to be moderators and hope that nobody gets elevated because i'm pretty sure that somebody's gonna say especially if you get people who are pro cop somebody's gonna say something that the other probably doesn't mind. yeah so we're gonna if, if if that happens we're gonna do our best like hey now we don't do that here kind of stuff so i mean maybe like i said we're still working it out but maybe maybe not it all just depends on I guess how the people perceive it and how it's accepted. Cause I regular was saying like a lot of people seem to really like that last episode and I'm not surprised. I think I just didn't think that that would be the one that everybody gravitated towards the most. So I think right there, let's just know that there's an audience that wants to listen to it, that wants to hear it. But I mean, but yeah, like Regan said, I, I guess we'll just figure it out um, as we do it. Well, as we've seen, especially in the last couple of weeks, uh, sports sometimes takes a backseat. I've heard athletes that have said, Bradley Beal comes to mind, that they're not worried about when the NBA or these other leagues will return because there are bigger issues right now. Mm -hmm. So I'm looking forward to it, and I'm not surprised that your most recent podcast is the one getting the most attention because it's fun to talk sports, but right now we've got – a discussion that has been simmering for a long time and finally boiled over just a couple of weeks ago with the backdrop creating conditions to make this ripe. So you have everything that's happening. It's been this long simmering fire and we finally got the spark. Is there anything you would like to add about George Floyd or the protests or anything else involving racism, prejudice, and equity that we haven't touched on yet? Um, I think, I think honestly, the, the, the only thing I could add to it is just, I just hope that this teaches everyone a lesson, cops, military personnel, just people in general, like, there's ways to treat people, whether they've done something or not, Killing is never a proper way. Like, I feel like, um, if, especially if nobody's threatening your life, especially if the person's not, you know, if they're not threatening you, they're, they're not resisting. I just feel like handle them, ha handle, handle the situation, I guess, as positively as you can. There was no need for what happened to transpire. I feel like if you see something like that again, stop it, step in and say, yo, like, what are you doing? There's a better way to do this instead of just being brute all the time. I mean, that's, that's, that's honestly the only thing I could think of. And, and, um, my thoughts and prayers obviously go out with the families of George Floyd and Brianna and, and Ahmad and, and the ones who have, um, unfortunately perished before them. I mean, that's, I don't really know if there's anything you can really say above that. Cause it's just, it's, it's a sad situation and it sucks that it keeps happening and it sucks that you have these families that have to deal with this. Um, I mean, so other than that, I don't really know if there's anything, anything else that I could say that could really make anything better for them or for anybody else involved. Yeah. Um, I mean, KT pretty much covered it, but something that you'll hear me say on our podcast is our podcast uh latest episode is you know no platform is too small no platform is too big the most important thing is to make sure that you use your voice and a quote that i've lived by my entire life because my mom instilled it in me from a young age is do what's right because it's right and do it right right now it's a matter of what's right and what's wrong so make sure you use your platform to you know to tell people what's right and what's wrong and speaking of platforms, if you want to hear what Crystal and Raken have to say on their podcast, you can find it at unwantedpod.podbean.com. And I understand you also have a social media presence as well. Yes. Um, our Twitter, our podcast Twitter is at unwantedpod, um, as well as my personal is at underscore RAP24. 
um, and, and my personal Twitter is pup tent 10 P U P T E N T 10. Um, yeah. I mean, I guess you can just, just find us there and, and talk to us there about it. I mean, you guys could talk to us about this. You could talk to us about our pod, literally anything, as long as it's within the rules and regulations of not being disrespectful, basically. But yeah, I mean, we're, we're, we're open to talk to anybody about anything. Yeah. And before long, there'll be Facebook and Instagram pages, and these two will be stars, and we'll get to say, remember when? <laughs> but Crystal, I thought of you, actually, because and Crystal and I have known each other for years through our WNBA uh, chats, and I covered the league for 10 years, and the running joke is how Crystal's doppelganger is Tierra Ruff and Pratt, and <laughs> I imagine, well... I know I gave her a hard time when she joined the Sparks, but <laughs> earlier this week she talked about her cousin being killed at the hands of police officers. So George Floyd and Breonna Taylor, those incidents hit real close to home for her. And I imagine you uh, read that conversation yeah. and it goes back to what we were talking about earlier. Like No matter what team you root for, no matter who you like or dislike, everyone has a connection or have thought about what might have happened. I know that's what I thought of with uh, George Floyd and all the others. It's again, not something I'll have to have to worry about. I'd have to do, I'd have to engage in conduct that is obviously blatant where you would have <laughs> no room for interpretation, but I know a lot of friends through my basketball coverage who can't say that. Yeah. And, and, and honestly, I think it's, important for people like TRP to speak out because it's an experience that she went through. And so for her, I'm pretty sure it's a different type of pain. I, I hopefully never have to go through that ever. But I mean, just being black, I mean, it's, it's, it's a scary thing because you never know. But I know for her, because she actually went through it, it hits different. And um, I actually remember hearing that story when that first happened. And I thought her words were beautiful. Like I, I, I understood exactly where she was coming from. So, Reagan, if the Sparks need somebody or if TRP gets injured, do you think Crystal could serve as her body double and <laughs> hold nah. on against uh, the likes oh, of... Oh, <laughs> nah. Put me nah. in the game, that was, Coach. I am yeah. ready. And they'll do better calling me. I'm a, whoa, I'm a defensive guru, first of all. Don't play me. Lockdown. Elena Beard <sighs> retired, so they need somebody. For real, I'm a lockdown. You know, she... Look, look, I'm a lockdown... I could put my little TRP headband on. They won't know the difference. They'll probably be like, yo, she got a little bit shorter over time. But other than that, they not going to know a difference. I'll get out there locked down. I'm telling you, if y'all need me, call me. I'll even do you one better. I'm not a Lynx fan, but if the Lynx need a practice player. No. <laughs> whoa. <laughs> she just flat out said no. I was trying to help. So Reagan said no, so I can't do it. Oh, I'm sure they could find a spot for you in Minneapolis. You know, K KT should not be on anyone's team. Just putting that out there. Wow. All right. Well, Beth, there's going to be an unwanted opinions you, you, uh, shootout <laughs> come in. Watch basketball shootout. Crystal, don't you feel appreciated? I man, <laughs> see, this is what happens all the time in the podcast. Reagan will say something, and she'll try to be like, "Oh yeah, well, you know, KT is bad at this." I'm just like, "Wow!" Like she was coming from my 2K player one day. I forget about that. She, you, uh, watch. Whenever, whenever we are face to face again, we're gonna do like some unwanted opinion challenge or something. And I'm, I'm getting, I'm getting, I'm getting a W. I'm getting a W. It could be a nerf. It could be a nerf challenge. It could be a, a little dunk off challenge on a little mini rim. I'm getting a W though. So, okay. Well, let me know when you decide to hold this challenge, because if I'm able to make it work, I might uh, travel to your location and <laughs> offer it as a video. Oh, bet. Series. Bet. That would work. So, would work. so hey, the because then you have proof. Yeah, right. Yeah, the whole world can see Reagan lose. See? The whole world can see Reagan lose. That's all see, we need. Y'all remember when I said early in the show that words hold no weight until action is put mm -hmm. behind it? Yeah. She just don't know. I'll beat her in a 50 meter swimming challenge. Um, I don't play tennis, so Reagan's gonna give me a tennis. I don't bowl that well, but I will practice to beat Reagan in a bowling match. 
I'll, I'll mini golf, you know, not real golf because I'm terrible, but mini golf. It could be a, a what is that thing called? The, the game that you Top hit golf. The ball and it goes, no, oh. the game that you hit the ball, tether ball. It could be tether, tether ball. ball. It could be a one versus one dodgeball challenge, you know, anything. I'm, I'm game for any type of challenge. Uh, it could be a one meter race, one meter sack race. It don't even matter. You feel me? I'm, I'm like Jordan up in this thing. Championships, you know, Lisa Leslie, all of that. I'll do you one better to make it recent. I'll be like the um. I'm a, I'm a, I'm a, we gonna be we gonna be, and just because he's a Minnesota fan, we gonna be a Minnesota Lynx. Uh, I'm gonna be the Minnesota Lynx of the challenges. Even though I'm a Sparks fan, that hurt me to say low key. But just because you know Mike is a Minnesota fan, I gotta show him his team some respect a little bit. Well, we've got four championships to our credit, so I don't think uh, <laughs> respect is an issue up here. So go to Unwanted Opinions to hear future plans or to see the future plans for the George Floyd conversation unfold with Reagan and Crystal and then stick around for this challenge that's going to take place where Crystal can finally have the opportunity to back up her athletic skills. <laughs> the pressure. Well, Reagan, Patrick, Crystal Thomas, thanks for coming on and I know the two of you will continue these conversations on your podcast, but I'm glad you were willing to share your thoughts with us as everyone continues to grapple with a real time situation. And I know this hasn't been pretty for all of us these last couple of weeks. It was tough to see my home state on fire for a few days, but this could be the catalyst for lasting change as well. And I hope I'm around to see that, whether it's a month from now, a year from now, a decade, but there are a lot of reasons to think this won't end like all the others, as unfortunate as it was. Uh, I, thank you for having us on, honestly. Yeah. Um, you know, like Reagan said, like no platform is too big or small. So, uh, I mean, I'm just happy we even had the opportunity to talk about this um, you know, on your show. So I, I, I appreciate you for just even letting us do this. Yeah, definitely. Once again, Crystal Thomas, Reagan, Patrick, unwantedpod.podbean.com or at unwanted pod on Twitter. If you want to stay up to date on the unwanted opinions podcast series. And that will do it for this episode of Mike Up Sports. And as always, if you have something to say about George Floyd as we continue our discussions, just hit me up at tsbtelevision at gmail.com or on social media, send a DM to Twitter or Instagram at the Mike Peden is where you can find me. Once again, thanks for watching this special edition of Mike Up Sports. Until next time, stick around. Blah, blah. <laughs> <laughs> wow. I well, this is history in the making. I flub my own ending and I've recorded several of these. So once again, <laughs> thanks for watching this edition of Mic'd Up Sports. We'll see you next time.